And my name is Alec Harris. I'm the Manager of Legislative Services and Deputy Clerk for the Town of Ajax. And I'm also the Project Manager for this year's municipal election. So I'll just give you a quick overview of what we'll talk about today. First, you're going to hear from me, and I'm going to give an overview of the 2018 municipal election. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about how voters will get access to their ballots, how they get their credentials to use the internet and telephone voting system, uh, and how, they, how the system works. Then we'll hear from Brian Lack, president of Simply Voting, who's going to talk about the internet and telephone voting system provided by Simply Voting and give a demonstration of uh, both of those systems. Uh, we'll be doing a little Q&A after the presentation, so if you have any questions or think of anything during the presentations, please save them for the end. Uh, there will be an opportunity as well to try out the internet voting platform yourselves. We have a couple machines set up on the side of the room here uh, and some test pins and ballots that you can try out as well. So just to start out, I wanted to note, uh, Nicole already talked about this a little bit, but 2014 was really a watershed moment for elections in Ajax. Uh, that was the first time that we rolled out the internet and telephone voting platform. Uh, and our plan at the time was to make voting as convenient and as, as accessible as possible for voters to cast their ballot when, how, and where they wanted during the voting period. Um, after the election, the success of that model was very apparent to us. Uh, we did some post-election surveys of people who use the system, and we had a 98% satisfaction rate with the platform. That was a big signal for us that, that we had chosen a model that really worked and that people enjoyed using and that they got that convenience and accessibility out of. Uh, we also saw an increase in voter turnout. Uh, in 2014, we had a voter turnout of just over 30%, compared to about 25% in 2010. So the model also might have been responsible for bringing a few more people in to exercise their right to vote. So this sent a really strong message to us that when we were planning the 2018 election, uh, what we wanted to do uh, to use internet and telephone voting again, and the kinds of things that we could build on and make better for this time compared to 2014. So voting integrity remains a top priority for us. Uh, overall, we're extremely confident in the security and the integrity of both internet voting generally as a concept and in the particular application of the Simply Voting platform. Uh, Brian's going to speak a little bit more to that later. Uh, Ontario municipalities have been using internet and telephone voting systems since as early as 2003, uh, and they've been used in many other jurisdictions and in many other industries for holding uh, successful, accountable voting. Uh, while the concept may seem new to a lot of municipal voters, it's actually a well-established practice that's used in quite a number of Ontario municipalities and probably more than ever before in 2018. Uh, another critical priority for us is customer service. One thing we learned from 2014 was that, was that the vast majority of voters did take advantage and use the internet and telephone voting system to, re to vote remotely, uh, but there were still many voters who attended uh, physical voter assistance centers for a variety of reasons. Uh, in some cases, it was because they were familiar with where that voting center was and they went as a matter of practice. Uh, others because they thought perhaps they could get a paper ballot there and vote in a more traditional way. And others still because um, they weren't aware that they could vote from home or they weren't aware that they could vote from a mobile device. Uh, so communication about the availability of these technologies is a really important piece for us uh, from the customer service perspective and something that we'll be focusing on strongly this time around. Um, the result of having people who, who come to voter assistance centers who, who have everything they need to vote otherwise is that you get longer lineups for those voters who do need assistance and that customer service experience can be a bit diminished for those voters that, that need to come and have their information corrected or need assistance using a computer or accessing their ballot. Uh, finally, in keeping with the town's long-standing history of being a leader in environmental sustainability, uh, we continue to cut down on the enormous volume of paper that's consumed from traditional elections. Uh, a traditional election in Ajax would historically require the printing of tens of thousands of paper ballots and the printing of thousands more pages of manual voters lists, and they get quite substantial in size. Uh, internet and telephone voting platforms allow us to do away with all of that paper consumption, and the use of an electronic voters list allows us to do away with the paper voters list as well. Uh, and that's an important part of reducing the environmental impact of the 2018 election. So, just as in 2014, Ajax voters will be able to cast their ballot anywhere, anytime with an internet-connected device or telephone uh, between October 15th and October 22nd. Voting will open at 10 a.m. on October 15th and close at 8 p.m. on October 22nd. Voting online or by telephone is really easy. During the first week of October, Ajax voters will receive their voter information letter in the mail 
and that letter will contain each voter's unique secret PIN. So that's the number that you as a voter get to use to access the system. And it also contains the website address and the telephone number that you can use to access the internet or the telephone voting platform. To cast your ballot by internet, simply go to the web address on the letter, enter your PIN and your date of birth, and you'll be presented with your ballot. To cast a ballot by phone, call the local or toll-free number that's listed on the letter, uh, enter your PIN and date of birth just the same as you would on the internet platform, and you'll be provided with an audio ballot that you work through making your selections for each race until you submit. So Brian's going to give a demonstration of both of those platforms and talk a bit more about them in greater detail. Uh, in many municipalities, the move to remote electronic voting uh, has often coincided with the elimination or the reduction of in-person voting opportunities. Uh, in 2014, we recognized that this was the first time we were using that model and a lot of voters might have some trepidation about it, they may not be comfortable with the technology, or they might not be aware that we're doing that. So we provided t uh, 10 in-person voter assistance centers in 2014 which was roughly the same number of voting sites that existed in previous Ajax elections in, in a more traditional model. So based on our experience in 2014, we'll still be offering voter assistance centers because they were well attended. Uh, however, they'll be fewer in number and larger in size. So instead of having 10 voter assistance centers in 2018, we're actually just going to have three, but they're going to have as many resources as were deployed to all 10 sites consolidated into those three locations. And they'll be at the Ajax Community Center, the McLean Community Center, and the Audley Recreation Complex. Uh, the reason we did this is because when we looked at uh, the attendance at different voter assistance centers in 2014, we had a number of satellite sites that just did not have the attendance that our larger centers did. Uh, and that was kind of to be expected. People think of where they can go to vote, they think of their local community center, and that's where they go. And because of that, those sites had a lot of people and just as many resources as the smaller sites that didn't have quite as many people. So our goal this time is to consolidate those resources, deploy the same amount in terms of staff and voting kiosks, uh, but have them consolidated to try to get rid of some of those bottlenecks and, and get people through and able to vote much more quickly. At the voter assistance centers, voters will be able to use large touchscreen PCs uh, with the voting website preloaded. You simply sit down, enter your PIN and your date of birth from your voter information letter, and you'll receive your ballot just like you would if you did it at home on a computer. Once you're finished voting, uh, the computer will receive your uh, vote uh, and then log you out and will be ready for the next person to sit down and cast their ballot. No information about how a person votes from a voting kiosk will be visible or accessible to the next person who sits down. All they'll see is the login screen to do it again. At those sites, uh, we will have friendly and helpful election staff uh, who will be on hand to assist voters if they have questions or they need help casting their ballot. And voters can make revisions to the voters list as well if they, uh, if they identify any errors in their credentials or they find that they're not on the voters list. They can talk to a revisions officer and get themselves added or their information corrected. All election staff will be trained on customer service, accessibility, and the importance of maintaining the secrecy of the ballot ensuring that the confidentiality of voters' uh, selections is maintained if they're receiving assistance. We'll also be offering special polling opportunities at retirement residences and long-term care facilities in Ajax. And just as a reminder, I, I mentioned this a bit earlier, but the voter assistance centers are primarily intended for voters who genuinely need assistance with casting their ballot. So if you're a voter and you receive your information letter uh, and you're comfortable using the internet and telephone, um, just follow the instructions on the letter and you'll be able to cast your ballot remotely anywhere, anytime during that voting period. Um, we won't have any paper ballots at the voter assistance centers. And if you don't need assistance with casting your ballot, we do ask that you use the remote systems available uh, to be courteous to those voters who do need assistance, who do come to the sites and require help one way or another. So, if you voted before, either provincially, federally, or municipally, uh, you might have encountered a time when you weren't on the voters list, even though you haven't changed addresses since the last time you voted and your information is exactly the same. Uh, this does happen from time to time and we know that it can be very frustrating for voters. Uh, and we do our best every election to make sure that all Ajax residents who are entitled to vote are on the voters list before we print the voter information letters and mail them out. We make our best efforts to make sure that everyone who's entitled to vote is on that list so that they get the letter with their credentials to cast their ballot. Uh, there are some things that residents and voters can do to make sure that they're on the list ahead of time. Uh, we encourage all voters to check right now if they're on the voters list in advance 
by going to voterlookup.ca, which is a service provided by MPAC. Uh, if you visit this website, you'll be able to enter your personal information to check if you'll be on the voters list. And if you aren't on the list or your information is not correct, you can make corrections right there and we receive that directly from MPAC when we get the data for the voters list. So it's really convenient to do it at this time before the voters list is published because after that you have to come and talk to us and submit forms and make corrections on the list directly. So go to voterlookup.ca, check to see if you're on the list. If you are, you don't have to do anything. If you aren't or you need corrections, you can submit them right there. So one of the big puzzles around uh, internet voting and telephone voting is this question of unsupervised voting. Uh, and something that comes up whenever we have a discussion about uh, remote voting technologies. Um, there's always a concern that it could lead to an increase in potential. Oh. Please and thank you. I'm just going to keep speaking. Um, so there's always a concern that remote voting systems could lead to a potential increase in voter fraud because compared to a traditional election where it's supervised, someone comes in, presents their identification and says, I've got my credentials to vote, they get a ballot, they do that. Uh, there's always concerns around unsupervised voting, but you may not be aware that unsupervised voting has actually been around for decades in Ontario municipal elections, primarily in the form of vote by mail. Uh, many rural communities and even some urban municipalities have used uh, vote by mail and it's a widely accepted uh, form of voting that is considered legitimate for municipal elections. Uh, and in fact, when you compare internet and telephone voting to vote by mail, we actually gain uh, an increased ability to investigate potential issues of voter fraud. Uh, and that's because the internet and telephone voting systems provide us with audit trails of how pins were used, where they were cast from, those kinds of details, which we wouldn't get if we were using something like vote by mail. So for example, uh, if we received 100 ballots from a particular internet IP address, we would be able to see that information, make a determination if there's an issue, and do an investigation based on that and know where they came from. Whereas with vote by mail, we wouldn't have those options available to us. So we view it as, as kind of an enhanced version of remote voting that gives us those extra tools compared to more traditional forms of unsupervised voting. Uh, to be clear, uh, just because there's an audit trail of when ballots were cast doesn't mean that we know how you voted. So once a ballot is cast, it's completely separated from the pin that cast it. We can never go back and, and look and say, this person voted this way. That's not a possibility with the system. But if needed, we could examine where a pin was voted from. And because of that, it gives us the ability to uh, investigate potential issues in much greater detail than vote by mail would. It's also important to remember that a lost or a stolen voter information letter uh, would not automatically become votable to somebody else. They would also need to know that the associated birth date that goes with that pin. So if somebody did in fact steal a voter information letter or found, the, found one that somebody threw in the recycling, they couldn't then turn around and vote with it. They would need that other piece of information. So it'd be very difficult for a total stranger to uh, vote using someone else's credentials. If you do lose your voter information letter, uh, or you think it's been stolen, uh, give us a call and report it. We can immediately disable that pin and issue you a new one in order to ensure that any lost pins or any misplaced pins uh, are not improperly used. We take concerns around voter fraud very seriously, um, but we also need to be careful about how much credibility we give to stories and anecdotes about potential issues. So, for example, I heard that my neighbor's spouse used their pin to cast a vote. Those stories will always kind of propagate. It's very important for us as clerks and returning officers that we take any substantiated claims of voter fraud uh, seriously, and we will always report those to the appropriate authorities for investigation. However, it's also the complainant's responsibility to substantiate those com complaints and show to us that there is a serious concern. I just wanna note that of the about 100 municipalities that used uh, internet voting in 2014, none experienced any case of voter fraud, security breach, or process-related challenge that was sufficient to controvert the outcome of their election. So there were no instances where uh, potential issues that were reported were a, a risk to the outcome of their elections. So to help combat the potential for voter fraud, we do our best to educate the public about how to protect their PIN, uh, about the serious penalties that are associated with voting with someone else's PIN or with mail theft, uh, and ensuring that people understand the consequences of stealing and voting someone else's PIN. They are very serious. 
Uh, just a couple other notes about things that are unrelated to internet voting specifically. Um, many residents may not be aware that Ajax Council itself will be undergoing some changes in 2018. Uh, after a lengthy review process that was concluded in 2016, the region of Durham has decided to grant Ajax one additional seat at the regional council table beginning with this term of council. Uh, this is due primarily to the population growth that's occurred in Ajax over the last several decades. In order to make room at the local council table for one more regional councillor to be elected, uh, Ajax has had to update the composition of its council and the ward boundary system as well. So we're staying with the seven member of council, and that means that um, whereas in 2014 voters elected a council that was comprised of the mayor, two regional councillors, and four ward councillors, in 2018 voters will be voting for the mayor, three regional councillors, and three ward councillors. So this also means that Ajax has had to change how it elects its council members. Uh, in 2018, we'll be moving from the current four-ward system to the new three-ward system, which is illustrated there. And I think we have some other samples posted around the room. Uh, a ward boundary review was conducted in early 2017, which looked at how best to design the new wards. Uh, we held three public consultations in early 2017, along with an open survey of residents, in order to understand what people's preferences were for for what particular arrangement of three wards made the most sense for Ajax. Uh, the new ward system is designed to balance current population sizes between each of the wards, uh, consider the town's future population growth and where that growth is occurring, use clear and logical boundaries, uh, such as roads and natural features, and ensure that distinct communities of interest are maintained within singular wards so that they have a clear voice at the council table. Uh, the new wards are shown here, and they were approved by Council in April of 2017. Now, moving from four wards to three means that there will be many voters uh, who will be in a different ward than they were in 2014. Uh, if you aren't sure which ward you're in for 2018, uh, you can visit our election website at ajax.ca slash vote2018 and check out our What's My Ward tool. Uh, all you have to do is enter your address and you'll be shown what ward you're currently in for this term of council and what ward you'll be eligible to vote in for 2018. Uh, and, and in this election, each of those three wards will be electing one local councillor, one regional councillor, and voting for the mayor. So with all this information in mind, if you're an Ajax voter in 2018, there's a couple things that you can do to help prepare yourself for this election. Uh, first, check if you're on the voters list by visiting uh, voterlookup.ca. Make sure to check that your school support and your personal information is correct. And if you have other voters in your household, you can check their information as well. Confirm your ward. If you don't know what ward you're in or think your ward might have changed, try out the What's My Ward tool on our website. You can also visit our website at ajax.ca slash vote2018 to see the list of candidates and to get updates on the election as we head towards October. And you can follow us on Twitter, at Town of Ajax, hashtag VoteAjax2018. We'll be doing a number of other outreach activities and events over the course of the summer. So that's all I have to say today. I'm going to turn it over to Brian now, who's going to talk about the internet and telephone voting system in greater detail. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to begin with a bit of background information on Simply Voting and our voting system. <clears throat> For First of all, we're fellow Canucks. Our offices are located in Montreal, and the primary data center is in Kelowna, BC, and our backup data center is also in Montreal. So your data will never leave Canada. Another interesting fact, we got started with internet voting back in 2003 when Simply Voting was a one-man show starring yours truly, and I developed an internet voting system for the Student Society of McGill University. We still count them as a happy customer today, 15 years later, which might not sound like much, but for an internet company it is a long time. And we've grown from a team of one to a team of 12, and we've grown from one customer to over 1,800 customers. Now, some of these customers are high-profile projects, such as Ontario municipal elections, 
such as the 2016 province-wide PEI plebiscite on democratic renewal, and such as last year's federal NDP leadership race. But during the year, we keep ourselves very busy with our bread and butter, which are countless elections for professional associations, not-for-profits, universities, unions, cooperatives even. Wherever there is voting, we are there. We work a lot in Canada, of course, but also in 56 other countries around the globe. It just never stops at simply voting. Yet, we have never had any security breach, and we have never seen the system go down due to any sort of system failure. And we're working very hard to keep it that way. <clears throat> We don't call ourselves simply voting for nothing. <clears throat> Our mantra has always been, let's make voting as simple as it could be. For the voter, whether you're voting by internet or by telephone, we've always tried to keep the interface and the experience as simple as possible. It doesn't need to be flashy. There shouldn't be, it shouldn't be confusing. It should be straightforward and get you to where you want to be quickly as possible with the least number of steps and where you want to be is casting your ballot. But we also try to keep it simple on the other side, on the back end, for the election organizers. Everything from setting up the election to downloading the results at the end of election night has been well thought out to be as streamlined as possible because the people organizing your election have plenty of other things to worry about other than the technology to make sure it runs smoothly. We're also very customer centric. And as Alec mentioned, we try to customize our solution to the customer, and that's definitely something we've done here in the town of Ajax. For example, the new decline to vote feature and what we call an undervote warning, which is a warning when a voter hasn't made all the selections that they are allowed to make. These new features are completely based on suggestions and feedback from the town of Ajax. The town of Ajax is not just a regular customer for simply voting. At many times, they are more like a partner because not only are we helping you by providing an internet voting system, but you are helping us make our system better. And we highly value this special relationship we have with Ajax. I like to talk about accessibility. As you know, <clears throat> the town of Ajax has moved from paper ballots to electronic ballots in the last election cycle, and that's generally a great step forward in terms of accessibility. Consider a voter with visual impairment. <clears throat> voting on paper usually requires having someone else help you, that someone else could see how you voted. On the other hand, voting by internet from the comfort of your own home is something that someone with visual impairments could do on their own and in perfect secrecy. But the catch is that not all websites are created equal when it comes to accessibility. Again, consider a visually impaired voter using a screen reader to vote online. A screen reader is a software that reads aloud the contents on the screen of the computer. If the website isn't properly designed for accessibility, the screen reader will be confused and read things out of order, and voting will become either cumbersome at best or completely impossible at worst. So we go to great lengths to make sure that the town of Ajax has a voting website that is very accessible, we're compliant with the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, and we follow the international technical standards for accessibility known as a WCAG2. We work with a third party called the Bureau of Internet Accessibility, and they actually audit our user interface to make sure we really are compliant. And we do testing in-house with a screen reader, a popular one called JAWS. And every time we make a major change, we use JAWS and we make sure that we could cast a vote with no problem without looking at the screen. Another thing to keep in mind is that the voting website is mobile optimized. So if you're voting with a cell phone with a very small screen, <clears throat> it will automatically adjust itself. You won't need to pinch and zoom or squint your eyes. The text, the fields, the buttons will be easy to read and easy to use. I'd also like to talk about security. <clears throat> there's many different layers of security because there's different aspects of the voting system that we need to protect. The first layer is what I call a secure ballot box. This is security specific to voting. So first of all, we wanna make sure that only eligible people could vote. Every step along the way while you're voting, as you click or as you push, push numbers on your touchstone phone, we're checking three things. A, you have logged in with a valid PIN. B, you're on the list of eligible voters, and C, you have not already voted. 
If any of those three checks fail at any point, you're kicked out of your voting session, you cannot continue to vote. We want to make sure eligible voters could only vote once. So we have technology in place so that if you are logged in with your valid PIN on 100 computers and you cast your vote on all 100 devices at the same split second, one vote will go through and 99 will not. And your vote is truly anonymous. When you cast your ballot, your selections are stored in one part of the database, while your elector record is stored in a separate part of the database, and we do not store any link at all between the two. So it's physically impossible, even for someone with direct access to our data, to piece together how you voted. There's also security at the software layer. A voting system is a piece of software. So our approach is knowledge. Our programmers actually learn the same hacking methods used by hackers, because that's the best way to know how to protect yourself against those methods. And when a programmer makes a change to the voting system, and believe me, we have many changes throughout the year, we're trying to improve all the time, a separate member from our IT department has to review the programmer's changes and approve them before they are allowed to go live. There's also security at the network layer. Our servers are up to date, they have antivirus, they're protected by an advanced firewall, which has an intrusion detection system, and as the name suggests, it will detect when a hacker is sending malicious activity over the wire. And instead of being passive, it's proactive. It goes out and it blocks the traffic at its source. Any communication from the outside world to our voting system is always encrypted with strong encryption. So if you're voting at an internet cafe, nobody could eavesdrop on your vote. <clears throat> then there's a layer of protection against DOS attacks, which are called denial of service attacks. And these are when hackers will bombard a website with tons and tons and tons of fake traffic just to overwhelm the website and make it go offline. The only way to really protect yourself from a denial of service attack is to work with a specialized company. And we work with Cloudflare. Cloudflare is simply the best. They've stopped the largest denial of service attacks the internet has seen. So we're in good hands. We have yet to be under attack. But if one happens during the Ajax municipal election, the protection of Cloudflare will kick in automatically and we don't need to lift a finger. Now, security is paramount to protecting the integrity of your election. It's typically the first thing that comes to people's mind when we talk about internet voting. So you shouldn't have to rely on my word for it, that we are taking security seriously. That's why we work with these six companies that either enhance, audit, or certify our security. As I mentioned, we work with Cloudflare. They stop denial of service attacks, but they also add an extra firewall, a cloud firewall called the Web Application Firewall, which is just an extra layer of protection between our network and the rest of the internet. The red rectangle, which is probably hard for you to see, but it's up there on the top, is our TrustGuard PCI compliance scan Every single day, they scan our servers for 80,000 plus known vulnerabilities, just to make sure we're not vulnerable even to one of those. Moving along, there's Trust E. They are a privacy certification company. Every year, they comb through our privacy policy and they look at how we designed our system from the voter's point of view and the back end to make sure we have privacy built in and we're giving adequate protection to your personal information. There's the red, uh, sorry, the round symbol, uh, which is a SOC 2 audit. Uh, we're actually in the middle of a SOC 2 right now. And that's when auditors check about 150 different controls we have to have in place for security. Things like, do we do background criminal checks on all of our staff? Do we use strong passwords? Do we have a disaster recovery plan in place in case if there's a fire at our primary data center? Uh, and will we? quickly move over to the backup data center? Do we do quarterly drills of our disaster recovery plan? Things like that. And then you have Fortify, that is a source code auditing company. We hand them over all the programming of our voting system and they analyze it looking for mistakes that could lead to a vulnerability. And last, you have the blue rectangle that is Spirant Security Labs. And these are good guy hackers that we hire to do a penetration test, which essentially means they will try to break into the voting system and find vulnerabilities that way. 
<clears throat> so all of these six companies provide us with reports and we share those reports with the town of Ajax. So like I said, we work very hard on security and you don't necessarily have to take my word for it. At this point, I'd like to switch over to the other podium and give a demonstration of the internet voting system and telephone voting system. All right, now before I could go online and show you the internet voting system, I should begin with a sample of the voter information letter. As Alec mentioned, everyone gets a letter. This is the current draft. Um, I'm sorry if it's a little bit small and scrunched and hard to see, uh, but you'll, I'll just talk you through it. On the top over here, you will find a pin. Uh, this pin is a nine digit random number that is unique to each and every eligible voter. It's essentially your password to log in to both the internet voting system and the telephone voting system. You will also find uh, the dates and times when voting begins and ends, the address of the internet voting system to visit to vote by internet, the toll-free number and local number to call in order to vote by telephone. There's information on getting help and on the flip side, you will find some legal information, the times and places to vote in person at a voter assistance center if you need assistance. And finally, the actual races and candidates that you will find on your ballot. With this voter information letter in hand, you could then go to the voting website, which would look like this. Uh, you see handy at the top, the uh, phone number and telephone number to call the voter help desk if you need assistance. <clears throat> uh, those will be operational in the fall. And by default, the voting website is in English, but if you prefer Francais, it's just a click away. Now I'll switch back to English for the demo. Uh, to log in, as Alec mentioned, you need your date of birth and your PIN. The point of the date of birth is that we do not print the date of birth on the voter information letter because everyone should know, hopefully, their date of birth. And that way, if the voter information letter falls in the wrong person's hands, if it's a stranger, they will not be able to steal your vote. If you get the date of birth and PIN combination wrong too many times, the system will also require you to fill out a Google CAPTCHA, which is one of those annoying puzzles, and that stops and prevents password guessing attacks. So without further ado, I'm going to log in as a dummy elector that I have handy. And this is a live demo, so bear with me. I just need to put in the date of birth, which is 1954, July 23rd. And the pin, 586, 873, 738. Now I'm logged in and I'm taken straight to my ballot. The first thing I will see is a blue bar with an option, I decline to vote. And we'll get back to that soon enough. Beneath that, you see the races one by one that you are allowed to vote for. The first race being, of course, the mayor. And the instructions are straightforward. You may select one of the following. So I could check the checkbox next to Neil to vote for Neil. But if I want to vote for Patrick, no problem. I could uncheck Neil and vote for Patrick. If I try to select another name, it won't let me vote tw for two names, it will just switch my selection. And I don't need to click on the box, I could actually click anywhere in each highlighted row to easily select the candidate. I move, uh, I've voted, I voted for Marcus for mayor, and I work my way down, and I see the regional councillor and local councillor for Ward 1. Now, my voter identity is tied to my PIN, so when I put in my PIN, the system knows who I am. It gives me the correct ballot. It knows that I am in Ward 1. So I make my selection for Regional Councillor, and I'll make my selection for the Local Councillor. And then we get to the Regional Chair of the Durham Regional Councillor, uh, Council, and let's leave this one blank and see what happens. 
And finally, we get to the school board trustee. Uh, this is the English Public School Board. And in this case, wards one and two uh, are voting together on the same trustee. So I will vote for Sam. Now my options are either to cancel and basically abandon my ballot or continue and let's move on and click continue. This takes me to the confirmation screen where I must carefully review my choices before I actually cast my ballot. So I see mayor, I voted for Marcus, regional councillor, ward one, I voted for May. Everything looks good except regional chair. There's a big red abstain which brings to my attention the fact that I skipped over it. Was it on purpose or was it a mistake? Well, let's pretend it was a mistake. <clears throat> and then as we get to the bottom, there's two choices. Well, there's one choice, two options. There is the continue button and the change button. It's not too late to change your mind or change your selections if you made a mistake. Or I could click continue and cast the ballot as is, and then it's final. So at this point, I haven't yet voted. If the lights go off, imagine we have a power failure. I still haven't voted. I could wait until the power failure is finished and go back online and vote. It will still let me vote. I could instead not wait for the power to come back on and vote by my cell phone using telephone voting. But once I click confirm, I am done. But let's click change and pretend that we didn't mean to skip over the regional chair. We'll vote for Peg and just for fun, we'll switch Sam to Samantha and click continue. Now the confirmation screen looks better to me. I see the regional chair is Peg and I've selected Samantha for the Durham District School Board. I'm happy with my vote and I will confirm. There we go. I just voted. I'm also logged out. In fact, I could log back in and I'll just quickly show you how that looks. <clears throat> uh, 1954. July 23rd, and the PIN, 586, 873, 738. The system will let me log back in, but it knows I've already voted because my PIN is attached to my identity. So there's nothing I could do. I could even call right now the telephone voting system and log in with my date of birth and PIN. It will let me log in, but it will say, sorry, you've already voted and it will hang up on me. So there's not much for me to do here. I'll just log out. And now I would like to log in with a second voter identity to show you a couple other things. So this date of birth is 1978, July 9th. and I will enter the PIN. Now, the ballot at first looks the same. However, this voter is from Ward 3, not Ward 1. So we see the regional councillor and local councillor of Ward 3. I'll make my selections for those races. And I will make my selection for the regional chair. And this voter is not the English Public School Board. This voter is with the English Catholic School Board. So I could make my selection for the Durham Catholic District School Board. And there are two trustees. The instructions say you may select two of the following. So I could select Candace and I could select Miranda, but I cannot select a third. It will not let me. It says you may only select up to two options. So if I click continue on the confirmation screen, I will see all my selections and for the Catholic District School Board, there are two candidates that I am currently voting for. Now what happens if I only selected one? Let's just quickly try that. I will change my mind and deselect Miranda and click continue. This is a valid vote. I actually may cast my ballot this way and only vote for Candace and vote for one instead of two. However, we put a warning note you selected less than the maximum number of candidates for this race because some people might not carefully read the instructions and might not realize they could vote for two instead of one. So that will ca help catch that mistake. One more thing I would like to show before I cast this ballot, I'll change my vote one more time. And you have that decline to vote feature up on top. Now this is something new with the Municipal Elections Act that wasn't there in 2014. 
Now every voter has the right to decline their vote and not vote at all. So that's why that checkbox is there. You could click it and then your whole ballot disappears. Instead, you see a message, only choose this option if you intend to decline your ballot. Otherwise, uncheck it and proceed to vote below. So I could uncheck it and my ballot comes back or I could check it again and it goes away. And if I want to decline, I then click continue. I get a special version of the confirmation page that warns me I'm choosing to decline my ballot and no vote will be cast. And I could click confirm and there you have it, I've declined to vote. And just like if I cast a normal ballot, I could log back in, but it will know that I'm no longer eligible to vote. It will not let me vote twice. And that's pretty much all there is to it, to the, our internet voting system. I would like to give a demonstration of the telephone voting system. It's very tricky to do it live. So if you'll bear with me, I would like to play a four minute video just to explain how that works. Simply Voting provides web-based and phone-based voting systems for municipal elections. We'll help you cast your ballot conveniently and securely. Before the election, you'll receive a voter information letter with a web address where you can vote online, a phone number so you can vote by phone, as well as other important information. Your letter will also contain your personal identification number or PIN. Keep this letter safe you'll need it to cast your ballot. To vote by phone, simply call the toll-free number listed in your letter from any touchtone phone, even from your cell phone. Welcome to the telephone voting system for the municipality of any town. You will be asked to enter your complete date of birth, starting with your year of birth, then your month of birth, and then your day of birth. After you have entered this information, you will be asked to enter your PIN. Please enter your PIN followed by pound. Enter your PIN and press the pound key. If you made a mistake, you'll be prompted to try again. Once you log in, you will have the option to proceed to vote or to decline to vote. The Anytown Municipal and School Board elections. To proceed to vote, press one. To decline to vote, press 2. If you decline to vote, you will be asked to confirm that you do not wish to submit any votes in any of the races on the ballot. If you would like to vote, you will hear the first race in which you're eligible to vote. Mayor. Be sure to listen closely. Please select one of the following candidates. To select Philip Green, press 1. To select Neil Chaplin, Press 2. To select Jane Doe, press 3. After listening to the candidates, you'll hear To abstain, press 0. In this race, you may choose a candidate or you may choose abstain to leave this answer blank. And in some races, you can choose more than one candidate. Please select up to two of the following candidates. Choose a candidate just like before and then listen for more options. You may select an additional candidate. If you are finished, press zero. Choose a second candidate or press zero to move on without making another selection. Your ballot may include one race or many races. Simply work your way through one by one. When you're finished, you'll hear a summary of your selections. Please confirm your choices. Mayor, Jane Doe, Counselor for Ward 1. Listen carefully to the summary. When it's complete, you can confirm your choices or go back and make any changes. To submit your choices, press 1. To change your choices, press 2. Pressing 1 to submit your choices is like dropping a paper ballot into the ballot box. Your vote is final and cannot be changed. Once you confirm your choices, you will be automatically disconnected. Your vote has been recorded. Thank you. Goodbye. When the election is complete, the municipality will publish the results, including who won each race, how many votes they received, what percentage of the vote they received, and so on. Thank you for voting.
Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Brett. It was a very thorough demonstration. Uh, so that concludes our formal presentations for tonight. I think at this point we'll open the floor to any questions if uh, anybody has anything that they heard tonight that they want to find out more about or uh, any questions they have, we're happy to answer. Yes, Joe? Um, so the first one is, uh, you can go anywhere. We mean that literally, like, you can have a foreign ID address, like when you're traveling to China, I can go around as long as it's, like, an access to the internet, I can go, correct? Yep. That's correct. Question in the back. Oh. Uh, Nancy? Oh, sorry, I just want to know, how many languages is it available in? Uh, English and French. Uh, Brian can probably speak to the language options available within the platform. Um, we have, in fact, for the, for the purposes of this election, we actually have adopted a bylaw that allows us to produce election materials in other languages. Mm -hmm. The ballot will be available in English and French. If voters require assistance in understanding that ballot, that would be a situation where going to a voter assistance center would be beneficial for that voter, and that would be the, the kind of resource that would be available to them. Uh, from a platform perspective, that would be correct. Um, some suggestions that we could offer for voters in those situations, if there's other members of their household who are more fluent in English or French, uh, one of the benefits of a system like this is getting assistance from a family member is quite easy to do uh, and, and something that the platform allows. So that would, that would be another option available to them. I think in a situation like that, the best approach would be to come to a voter assistance center if they felt that they weren't able to get adequate assistance outside of that environment. Uh, from a trust perspective, then the best best approach for them would be to come to a voter assistance center. Well, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that, that they don't trust their family. I'm saying if the family member likes one person, you can somebody else. But you know, it, it, it could be an issue. That's why I'm just asking: Is it in the future? Is it something that's being looked at from the language? Is it only English and French, or will be accommodating to others? Uh, the voting system has some uh, other languages built in that we've pre-translated. Uh, but none of those uh, languages are really uh, 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 applicable or helpful, I believe, to the population of the town of Ajax. Uh, and, it would, well, from the voting platform, we don't have that yet. Uh, may I ask what languages are uh, They are... They're all European languages. Yeah. Um, uh, <clears throat> there's uh, simplified Chinese, traditional Chinese, uh, Dutch, German, Italian. Um, Spanish, and uh, I don't know them. I don't. I could get back to you, but I don't have um, off the top of my head. Those are the ones I could think of right now. Sure. So, question over here. Yep. Sorry. Uh, the information letters will be sent out the first week of October. Uh, we send them out at that time in particular so that voters get them in enough time before the voting period begins, uh, but also not so early that they forget them or lose them or misplace them. Uh, how quickly can they replace a voter identification card? Uh, so let's say, like, lose it forever on mm -hmm. the number, and it's, it's a day that generates a new pin? Yeah, we can generate a new pin pretty much on the spot. Um, right. Depending on where we are in the election cycle, we might print out a new one and send it if there's enough time to do that. If it's during the voting period, we can just give you the pin. That's not a problem. And those phone lines are from, you know, like, so it's like, they're not 24 hours, 
No, they would be during regular business hours. And closer to the election period, we'll monitor the, we'll probably monitor them during the voting period. Yeah. Yes. The help number? Yes, it is actually. Yeah, that number is live, and if you call that, you'll get one of us. Yep. Yeah, the extension is 8683, which is vote. And if you give that a call, one of us will pick up. Sure. Over here? Over here? Or are you thinking about the ward map? Oh. Oh. Um, Thinking of this map here? The uh, what's my ward tool? That appears to be the old one. You're fixing it right now? Thank you very much. We'll, pu we'll pull that up in a split second. Yeah, so if you visit that website, it's our main election site. Um, we have a number of different information sources that are available there. Uh, one's called Your Ward, so you can check out the ward information and, and find out which ward you're in. One's called Candidates, and it's got a list of all the candidates who have currently submitted all of their nomination papers. Um, and then we've got other resources that are available. Uh, we have a section on um, uh, how to vote and how to check your voter credentials, uh, those kinds of details. Yeah? Sure. Yes. Uh, here, I'll, I'll, I'll take another pin. No problem. That's what <laughs> that's what this is all about. Actually, I didn't. Did I didn't cast? I did cast a second ballot. Okay, no problem. Nineteen sixty-six. <laughs> You're watching me. <laughs> April sixteenth. Okay. Two two eight. I have twenty pins here, so no problem. No, I'm saying I could do this many times. <clears throat> okay, over here, would you like me to abstain? So, I want to know why it is an abstain. I understand the reason it has to be on the ballot. I agree with you that it's important to have a ballot. But I want to know why it's an abstain. So that's more of a design question for us, and I'll, I'll feel that in two ways. It, to the first part, um, with respect to the decline, it, the reason that it's a more discrete option this time than it was previously is, uh, Brian had mentioned it before, there were changes to the Municipal Elections Act, and one of those changes was that we as election administrators are now required to report the number of declined ballots, whereas previously it, it might come up in, a, in uh, the vote totals and outcomes, um, now there's a requirement that we report it. So we made the conscious choice to make it a discrete option. And if, um, 
if you followed any of, the, any of the discussion about the provincial election and about declining ballots in that uh, election, there's a lot of discussion about uh, the process that was required about having to verbally say, I'm going to the returning officer and I'm declining my ballot. And it was a very not private way to do it. Um, we view this as having the same privacy as a regular ballot does, and, and in that respect is, is much superior to that. Oh no, that's why at the top. So we had this discussion internally as to where the appropriate location is for that, and our, our logic and our thinking with respect to why to put it at the top was that if you're a voter who has the specific intention of coming in to decline, you are doing it quite consciously. It's, it's not like other voters who, who look at it and say, I'm not going to vote, so I'm not going to log in, and I'm not going to bother. If you have the specific intention of coming in to decline, it's the first option, you just click it and you're done. For every other voter, they just proceed down the ballot. And our concern was that if we stuck it at the bottom, voters who were looking for that decline option may not see it right away, or voters that do regularly fill out the ballot because they wanted to vote get to the bottom and they see another box and perhaps they don't understand and they click it somewhat accidentally. It's less likely that they'll make that accident at the top, where the afterwards they just proceed down the ballot, than it is if they do it at the bottom. So that was kind of our thinking about it, and we debated that quite a bit. So the, to that point, the decline option, as Brian demonstrated, has a safety message on it. So if you get that message and you see that, it's an additional click, one more than the rest of the ballot has. Yes. So there's a, there's a, you, in order to accidentally decline a ballot, you'd actually have to make quite a few subsequent clicks to get there. Uh, and that safety message is there for that specific purpose, to, to warn people that this might not actually be what you, what you intended to do. You Tended to actually cast a vote, so just go back if you did. Interesting. And, and my second question there is the um, esteem. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so I will click continue without selecting anybody anywhere, and we will see many. Oh, I, I'm logged out, sorry. Okay, so I'll, I'll go to the confirmation page without selecting anybody at all, and you'll see many abstains. Now, just so you know, abstain is not the same as decline, legally or in the voting platform. Uh, you could abstain at a, at a race level, but declining is the entire thing. Yes. But my, my question is, why did you choose the word abstain? <clears throat> it's... Uh, it's our most popular term uh, for an abstention. Uh, it is something that... Just because uh, the reason I'm asking is, let me give you some um, uh, background to what I'm asking, is because if we're not including more than English abstention in language section, the word abstain, I'm asking why that particular word is chosen. It's not a common word used, and I'm just wondering why that was there a thought to another... Do you see where I'm going with that? Um, yeah, uh, it could be, uh, you're, for example, you're, think, you're asking, like, why can't, could it not be none of the above or something like that? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, it could be, uh, but... Um, is it too late to change this? Like, these questions I'm asking, is it like, Nancy, this is a done deal, can't you change? Or is this, hey, this is a thought for the future? Or we can look at that. What's the options? Yeah. Well, uh, go ahead. That, maybe that's more of a question for us. I, I think with respect to that, that's certainly something that we could get a more concrete answer for you on. And, and it, I wouldn't say that it's set in stone, but we are trying to be as deliberate in our choices on these as possible. Um, appreciate that abstain, abstain itself is not a, a fairly common word. Um, it's the equivalent of an undervote, right? Yeah. Um, so if there's a, for the sake of clarity for some voters, we can certainly consider other options. Uh, won't commit to whether we'll change it or not on consideration, but yeah, there are there are opportunities. And, and as Brian mentioned, we've made a lot of suggestions to improving the platform kind of in, on an iterative basis. And even in the last couple of weeks, we've made a lot of 
little changes and improvements to, to increase the clarity of how the ballot reads and how the different options present themselves. We have time to continue to make some of those changes, but at a certain point, yes, we will have to cut it off because the system needs to be ready to go live in order for the election to continue. 100%. That's, yeah. that's, fair, that's a fair response. I'd just like to consider that. Absolutely. Thank you. There was a question here about the town's voting website. I think we got it back live. Town's voting website. Thank you. Oh, it's in another tab. Oh. Thank you very much. So this is our uh, Vote Ajax website. Uh, when you open it, you're greeted with a nice big countdown that reminds you just how close the election really is. Uh, there's a number of tabular options here for information. You can find out about your ward. You can find out about voter registration, how to vote, uh, the candidates that have currently filed, information about third-party advertisers, frequently asked questions and resources. So for example, if you click on the candidates tab, you'll be brought to a page that shows just in accordion foldouts, all the candidates that have currently filed for particular offices uh, and the information that they've given us to share with the public for their campaign purposes. Uh, and that list is updated uh, whenever a new candidate comes in. We will send out an email broadcast uh, advising everyone who's subscribed to, uh, as to which offices have been updated. For the wards, there's just a quick overview of the new three ward system that describes uh, who voters will be able to vote for. And then there's the what's my ward tool. And I'll just open that up. So this was developed by our wonderful GIS and IT team. And when it opens, it just says hi and enter your address into the search bar to find out about your current ward. So if I put in any old address, just put in a number, It'll, all, it'll start to populate it based on the number right away. So if you fill in a couple letters, it'll probably find your address. And if I pick one, it'll zoom in on that spot and it'll say your current ward is actually ward three, but uh, in 2018, your new ward is ward one. And you put any address in the town into this and it will show you that. And you can actually even bring up the current boundaries to show the areas that have changed. So the dotted line shows the old or existing ward boundaries in the four ward system and then the colored areas show the new three ward system. So you can kind of visually see which areas of the town have changed. Okay. Yeah. Um, the voter support uh, centers, mm -hmm. you get, you get three of them. Uh, 2014, about what percentage of voters used them? So when we looked at the numbers, we think it, it worked out to roughly 75% um, used remote voting options and about 25% of ballots that were cast came to physical voting locations. So obviously it's a goal for us to, to change that a little bit. Uh, the more voters we can get using the remote systems, uh, the smaller lineups we'll have at the physical sites and the better experience it will be for those voters that need assistance. Um, I wasn't there for that. I don't know if Nikki can speak to that. Um, so the way that our voter assistance centers work, so under the Municipal Elections Act, if you are in a voting place at 8 o'clock, you're entitled to vote. So, and that's exactly how our voter assistance centers operate. So if you are in there at 8 o'clock, if it takes you until 8.15 to get added to the list and to cast your ballot, then, then we're going to stay open until everyone in there has had a right to vote. So the system works such that all the remote voting options close, uh, the access to those is closed right at 8 o'clock. If you're already in the system, you'll have a couple minutes to complete your ballot. But if you are like, physically in a voter assistance center, you have the right to vote, um, even if you're there right up until 8.45 or however yeah. long it takes. Yeah, and the, the way the uh, system is designed, all of the machines at voter assistance centers will continue to accept ballots until we give direction to shut those down. So they actually operate somewhat separately from the rest of the remote voting system, which closes at 8. And that allows us to make sure that those voters who were in line uh, prior to 8 o'clock are entitled to vote. Yeah? We call out to remind voters to vote. Do you have access to all our phone numbers? Uh, no, that's not something that um, we would uh, have access for for election purposes. and. and um, we do a fairly extensive advertising campaign for Vote Ajax. Um, we won't do uh, robocalls or things of that nature. Um, generally speaking, I think they can be a little intrusive, but they, they, um, we have a lot of other ways that we reach out to voters. Social media is obviously a big part of that today. Uh, but we'll do a lot of physical advertising in spaces around Ajax as well as in local papers. Why 
voter turnout in general. Um, I think the, the voter turnout within kind of the 25 to 30 percent range is actually quite normal for Ontario municipalities of, of kind of a, a size of age axis. Why? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think unpacking that talks a lot more about municipal politics in Ontario generally than it does about Ajax specifically. I think one reason is uh, perhaps the absence of a party structure, so you don't get as much kind of partisanship at the municipal level, uh, and so people don't identify with candidates as clearly. Um, I also think to some extent um, people don't have as much awareness around the importance of municipal voting and the kinds of services that municipalities provide for their tax dollars and the importance of engaging in municipal politics. There's probably a, a, a lot of reasons to, to unpack there. Um, you do, there are generally trends. You will see um, smaller places tend to have, smaller municipalities usually have larger turnout than more urbanized areas, but the 25 to 30% is, is about the average. I don't know if that completely answered your question. There's, there's a lot of factors in there. I'm just saying voter apathy. Like, that's why you said, you called them in the morning and said, have you voted in the last day? You know? mm -hmm. that's what I actually like that. Yeah. Um, like, it's a civic duty, really. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, Nancy, and say no, that, that's not something we would look at. I, all of our like work to get out the vote is really done up front. At, at that period of time, we're really focused on the integrity of the election and delivering a, a, a fair election and really focusing on, you know, that the, the outcome reflects the ballots cast. That's really our focus. We really, you know, we got a number of candidates here tonight. We really count on the candidates to get out that messaging on our behalf, and they've, they've been quite effective in doing that for us. So. Um, we'll do everything we can up front. Also, you know, Ajax, particularly North Ajax, has quite a young population. A lot of people don't have landlines anymore, so that's <laughs> just another factor. So our sort of our social media, online channels, news advertiser, these are the avenues that we find kind of put the most tentacles out into the community in that, that lead up period, if that helps. Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, the way our system works, we provide reports to the election officials uh, uh, that shows uh, IP addresses that have many votes from the same IP address. And the report contains all the activity. Uh, so you would generally look for patterns in the activity to see uh, is it, does it look like a library or a computer lab where there's innocently many people that happen to be voting from the same IP address? Or does it look like someone trying to stuff the ballot or a voting party or something like that where, where you see the patterns look differently? Uh, we don't have an automatic trigger, but the report is live and the election officials could access the report as, as frequently as, as they wish. Um, and you could see which IP address is have you know, just a few votes coming from them and which have many, many, many. And we also have the ability, uh, um, you know, you could be reactive or, or observe suspicious activity, or you could, um, if the clerk or election officials deem it necessary, we actually have the ability to block out a given IP address or phone number from the voting system for the duration of the election. And all those things are logged when, when, when it's, a, it's basically a firewall inside the voting system. Is that where our screeners come in then? Like they can build access to these IP addresses and they can follow the. So the IP addresses themselves would, would probably constitute personal information about right. particular addresses. I think at that point, if we were having that kind of discussion about a potential security issue, that's something that we would investigate and we would involve the candidates at the appropriate time. Now, 
with respect to what kind of evidentiary basis goes with that, we would be very upfront about it. I think that's our I think that's our obligation as election officials to be to be very clear about that. Um, it's not a situation that we've encountered in the last time that we did an internet or, or telephone voting, but um, it's certainly something that we would be very clear about if there were an issue and and what defines that as an issue and why we perceive it that way and what our actions we're going to take. Yeah, depending on the it depend on the situation. Yeah, it's entirely contextual, but yeah, that, that's a possible. Yeah. Any question? No. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, I have two questions actually. Okay. Can you find your polling not which areas that you're voting in by entering your postal code? Oh, your postal code into the into this particular tool. No, this one does by address. But um, is there a particular reason? Because okay. the next question is, can you uh, find or will there be in the letter a, a, a listing of where the polling stations are? Should you not wish to use it on Google Online? So on the voter information letter, we do have the voter assistance center locations and times printed on the letter. So if you need assistance, there's a section called voter assistance, and it's got those listed out. Yeah, we'll be doing special polls at the town's long-term care facilities and retirement residences. Yeah. So, so um, this tool, when it was, uh, this tool's been live for a little bit, and before we got into the election period, we actually had it populate um, the current councillor information. And as we moved into the election phase, we took all that information out, and it's just about showing you uh, what ward you're currently in and what ward you can vote for in 2018. Our intention after the election is to repopulate it with the information about who your current councillor is, who actually got elected to that office. So if you ever had a question, about who my counselor is and you needed their contact information, this tool could help you pull that up. For now, it's just about where, where will you have the right to vote. Uh, we do have information on the town's website about uh, current members of council, and you can always call our, our uh, 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 line if you have a question about who your counselor is, um, or if you have any questions related to ser customer service or any issues, and, and help you out that way. Oh, sorry, sorry. did you want to see who's running? Yes. So yes, first she goes there, then she yeah. goes to there. Yeah, so if you're at our... Yeah, so if you go to... Okay, so if you go to our website, ajax.ca slash vote2018, there's a tab here for candidates. If you click that, uh, it basically says nominations for candidates are being accepted from this time. Uh, candidates for each race that have submitted their nomination forms are listed below. And each office uh, on Ajax Council and for the school boards and the Durham Regional Chair are listed. So for example, if I want to know who's running in Ward 2 Regional, I click that and it brings up the list of everyone who's currently submitted their nominations. Ward 2 Local, it brings up that list. And so on and so forth. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, well, if uh, there are no more questions, then I think we'll end the, the Q&A session. Uh, thank you all for coming. We'd invite you, if you want to stick around, to try out the internet voting platform. We have some demonstration PCs set up over here on the right. There's uh, test pins and test dates of birth. Uh, that you can try out on the system if you want, and we'd be happy to provide any assistance if you need it. So thank you all for coming, and thank you, Brian. Thank you.